let's apply the derivative to optimization problems. So these are word problems. Shouldn't be afraid of them. It's just that you need a methodical approach to pull them apart. So let's see, we have a big checklist. So we'll go through it one step at a time and apply it to a few examples. Your first thing, read your problem carefully. We wanna note what's given, what we're looking for. We may have to name variables and you may wanna draw a picture just to clarify what's being asked for. Once we've gone through one, you go through your word problem line by line, extract all the info out of it. We're gonna to try to find an equation to maximize or minimize, and we're also looking for a constraint equation. So that's gonna be another equation that merely tells us about some relation between variables of interest. We may need to look these up. For instance, if you've got a max-min problem about spheres, and they don't give you the volume of the sphere, you may have to go and look that up. All right, our next step, assuming we've got two and three under control, we're gonna use three to get two in terms of a single variable. So that's the idea. Once we get it down to a single variable, we can move on to take a derivative, look for critical points, and then hopefully we have an answer. For our final step, we wanna make sure our answer actually makes sense. So we would wanna graph, make sure your answer is physically sensible if it's about a real world problem, and you may also have to worry about endpoints. So let's run this through an example just to see how each step works. My problem is I have 100 feet of fence to build a pen along a river. Find the dimensions that maximize area. So to start off, let's see. I have 100 feet of fence, but I don't have any variables to put that to, so let's draw a picture. I'm gonna have a river on one side, and we're gonna assume we're talking a rectangular pen here. So we're gonna build our fence out and then form a rectangle up against the river. So we note a few things. One is that we're only gonna have one side going opposite the river, and then that the opposite sides perpendicular to the river are gonna be the same length. So that's gonna give me an equation, 100 feet for using all the fence is equal to 2x plus y. What else do we have? So that's gonna cover everything in my first sentence. All right, I can't squeeze anything more out of that. So I go to the next sentence, find the dimensions that maximize area. So the big word here is gonna be area. So what's gonna be the equation for area? Well, we've named variables x and y on a rectangle, so our area is just gonna be x times y. So we have two equations. The thing I wanna maximize is the area, so that's gonna to correspond to two. So three is gonna to have to be our constraint equation. It's just gonna give me a relation between x and y. I have both equations. I'm pretty sure there's nothing else that I need, so I can proceed to step four. So the idea is gonna be this. I have my area function, but we only know how to do calculus in one variable, so I'm gonna to have to get rid of one of these. Okay, since we always work in x, let's get rid of the y. So I use my constraint equation, y is equal to 100 minus 2x. We can replace y with 100 minus 2x in our area equation. That puts me in terms of one variable. Okay, our final equation is gonna be 100x minus 2x squared. Now if you look at this, this is a parabola facing down. Okay, it's just got an x squared in it and the coefficients a negative number. So we'll think about that when we get to our graph at the end. Okay, we have our function in one variable. I can take the derivative. Derivative of a prime, it's gonna be 100 minus 4x. And so if I look for a critical point, I set this equal to zero, and that's gonna happen only at the point x equal to 25. Now, when x is equal to 25, I can stick that back into my constraint equation, and we see that that's gonna give us y equals 50 at this point. Also, if I stick 25 into our area equation, that's gonna give me 25 times 50, which is equal to 1,250 feet squared. So that'll be the maximal area, assuming that this is a maximum. So let's check. This would appear to be an answer, but I have no idea if it makes sense or not. So let's see what happens. 
I want to graph this, so I just got a point for the function a of x. We have x equal to 25, and the value there is going to be what we get when we stick it into the area function. So it's going to be our 1250. So that's the point where I have a critical point. I want to check increasing and decreasing on both sides, so I use the first derivative test. We pick a point in each region on each side of 25, and then see what sign comes out. If I put a zero in to my derivative, that's going to give me 100. That's positive. That's going to mean I'm increasing on this side of 25. Picking a point on the other side, let's go with 30, bigger than 25. We put that in the derivative function. That's going to give me 100 minus 120. That gives me minus 20, which is less than 0. So we're going to be decreasing on this side. So note, we're going increasing, decreasing. That has to be a maximum when I'm at 25. So my answer makes sense. Okay, on this one, it's actually interesting to see what's happening at the endpoints. Because notice, this is the area graph. And if I want to use the whole parabola, I'd have nonsense because areas can't be negative numbers. Okay, so if I try putting in the stuff below the x-axis, somebody's going to look at you weird, can't have a negative area. But what's happening at these points where we hit the x-axis? Well, if I let x be equal to 0, that's going to just flatten the whole thing out. We just have y equal to 100. So all we did was put the fence right up against the river. Okay, not very useful because there's no area either. At the other extreme, we have x equals 50. We'll think about what's happening there. If x equals 50, y is equal to 0, which means we're just going to take the fence, go out 50 feet, and then come back 50 feet, and there's going to be no y dimension to this. So this thing will also have area 0, as we would expect, because we're hitting the x-axis. Okay, there, a of x is equal to 0. Let's try this problem. Find the point on the line, y equals 2x minus 2, closest to the point 1 comma 4. We could kill this problem real easy if the point wound up actually being on the line, so let's check that it's not. So if I put 1 into the equation for the line, I get 0 out. 0 is not equal to 4, so our point's not on the line. So we actually have to do some work. Let's take a look. I'm going to read through. y equal to 2x minus 2, that's a relation between x and y probably going to be my constraint equation, so that's going to be 3. What else do I have? We have this business closest. What's closest mean? Closest means I want to minimize distance. So one thing we're not given in the problem is an equation for distance. So let's write that down. I have a point. I have a line. If I want to take a general point on the line, that'll be the form x comma y. And then my distance formula just says take the difference in the x's, difference in the y's, square them, and then take square root of that sum. So difference in x's gives me x minus 1 squared, y minus 4 squared, we add them, and then square root of the whole thing. So this is going to be the equation we apply the derivative to. We want to maximize or minimize this object. So here we're minimizing distance. Now, this is in terms of x and y. I don't like that because I only know how to do derivatives in one variable. So I can get rid of the y by using the equation of the line. y is equal to 2x minus 2. When I replace that for y, what do we get? d is equal to radical x minus 1 squared plus 2x minus 6 quantity squared. And now I can take a derivative. But I'm too lazy to do something like this, which has the chain rule in it. Let's look at the trick. I want to consider d squared. By the chain rule, the derivative of d squared is going to be 2d and then times derivative of the inside, which is d prime. Since my point is not actually on the line, the distance from the point to any other point on the line is always going to be bigger than 0. So I don't have to worry about d actually wind up being equal to 0. And in fact, d is always a positive number. It's a distance. So it's a distance that's not equal to 0 exactly. Because of that, these two numbers here are going to be exactly equal to 0 in the same places. And they're also going to be the same sign. 
Okay, so if this is positive at a point, this has to be positive at a point. This is negative at a point. This has to be negative at a point. So this is going to do all of our heavy lifting. So now we look at d squared. That's x minus 1 squared plus 2x minus 6 squared. No radical in sight. I take its derivative. Chain rule says 2x minus 1. Derivative of the inside is 1. Chain rule says 2, 2x minus 6. Derivative of the inside is 2. And I can work with that real easily. We collect our terms. I have 10x minus 26. And now this is going to be equal to 0 at Okay, just divide 26 by 10. x equals 2.6. My y, I put that into the equation for the line. That's 2 times 2.6 minus 2, which is 3.2. So I have my x and my y, which are a good candidate for my answer. If I figure out what d is at these points, we're going to have 1.6 squared plus 0.8 squared, square root, and that gives me roughly 1.79. So, on the graph of d, not d squared, I'm going to have 2.6 and then y value is 1.79. I want to check increasing and decreasing to make sure it's a minimum. So what I'm going to do is, we're going to mark off a line above our critical point, and now let's take a look. Now notice d squared and d prime are going to be increasing and decreasing in the same exact regions because both of these derivatives have the same sign and the same zeros in the respective regions. So I check one point on each side for d prime, d squared prime. d squared prime at zero is just going to give me, right here, minus 26. So I'm decreasing on this side. d squared prime of three is going to give me 30 minus 26, gives me four. So I'm increasing on this side. And you notice we have, in fact, a minimum. It's decreasing, hits our point, and then starts going back up again. So now that I have the graph of D, the only thing I need to worry about is whether my answer makes sense or not. So the question is, could there be a domain violation somewhere in the work that we've done? Well, if I take a look at our formula for D, we notice that we have a square root. Now, it would be bad if we put a negative number in there. But notice, since I'm taking the sum of two squares, if I take any number and square it, it's either 0 or a positive number. If I take any two numbers that are 0 or positive, they're still going to be 0 or positive. So the square root will never have a problem. It's always going to be taking a square root of either 0 or a positive number. So there won't be any domain violation, and our answer is perfectly legit.